Brought to you by JMR Rentals, professional digital cinema and broadcast equipment rentals in Brooklyn, New York. JMRNY.com. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and joining me via Zoom today, they are the writer-director team behind the indie feature Crossroads, Miss Laura Hemingway and Miss Gabrielle Muller. Laura and Gabrielle, welcome. Hi, thank you for having us. Thank you. It's great to have you. So uh, we have met before. We met at Contra Film Series. Uh, where you guys took home, uh, I think it was Best Feature that you guys won there. So congrats on that. If some of you are seeing this episode after seeing that, we're going to cover a little bit of the same ground, but we're going to get uh, more deeper into it. The film that you have is called Crossroads of America. I want to talk about that in a second. But first, I want to talk to you guys about you. How did you all come together and, and how did you become kind of a, a filmmaking team? So Laura and I met on a short film um, through a mutual friend who was also the cinematographer in the film, Alice Miller. Um, and Laura was doing costume design and I was doing production design. Yeah, that's the story. Um, I wrote Crossroads of America, um, sort of at the behest of Alice Miller. We were talking about doing something big, doing a feature, and I really wanted to get behind the writing of it. My background in education is in writing, and I hadn't had the chance to write something for film. And so I wrote the script knowing that Gabrielle would direct it. Uh, Laura, you, you're an actor as well, and you star in the movie. Um, and this was, I want to say, your first feature for both of you? Talk to me a little bit. For, well, first of all, before, so you know, people who don't know, what give us like the a little bit about what the film is and and can you give us like a, a log line or something like that so we know what the film is about and then kind of uh how you came upon the subject matter and so forth crossroads of america is about a young woman who is forced to move back in with her estranged fa family after uh, a tragic accident and in so doing she has to face the buried family secrets that tore them apart i call it a strongly worded love letter to my family <laughs> so it, was it was this kind of a personal experience thing for you is this something that you kind of wrote was it autobiographical or was it something that you heard it's not autobiographical you would have to know me really well to know what's like one for one measure but it is loosely inspired by my experience growing up with a single mom and having an older sister and a brother who was much younger than us and um, what it was like for us struggling to come together after we had experienced some generational trauma. For you, Gabrielle, directing this, so were you in from the get-go? Were you in on the writing stage of it or did she kind of present a script to you? I was in from the get-go because I knew that Laura, Laura and Alice were part of it. Um, but I was, I, I was interested from that point. But then I read the script, um, and it read as like a, a subtle exploration of generational trauma in this way that I hadn't really seen before. Um, and I was really inspired by it. And then it became this sort of conversation between the three of us, um, figuring out how we would do it. Um, what parts to emphasize um but at the end of the day yeah it was totally laura's script did you guys go through um with like a lot of revisions on it did you um did you have a lot of feedback and stuff on it or was it from jump kind of like was it the script we're gonna do the script kind of poured out of me which is like you know kind of cliche to say but it was sort of in its raw form it's a really raw movie we, it's a it's shot raw it's acted raw and it was it was written in a, in a way that i think is is indicative of that um we did do some collaborating on the dream sequences the genre of the film is a melodrama but it's also like psychological surreal dark comedy and the dream sequences we collaborated on we actually wrote those at kellogg's diner in williamsburg together the surreal nature is it just dream sequences or is it like a magical realism where you kind of don't know what's dream and don't know what's reality i definitely think there's moments of surrealism in the non-dream sequences i i think we were trying to get at like the surreal nature of living um 
in this world um, as Sandy is kind of grappling uh, with this family secret that everybody knows about, but nobody talks about. Um, and so the way that plays out in real life, I, we were trying to kind of find this balance between like this raw reality and this kind of magical real uh, surrealism. When was this made? You, did you guys make this during COVID or pre-COVID? Way before. We shot this in 2015. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is something that you, that's, was kind of like you had, and then was it, uh, a mat, did you need like completion money or something to get it finished? Like, how did you guys get it across the finish line? Cause you just, you were just in a festival in 2020. So like, give me a little timeline if you can, in terms of like from, from when it was first incepted until now. It was like a slow roll. It was never, we weren't never not working on it. It wasn't ever shelved. We made this for very, very little money. So when you do something really cheaply, it takes a long time. And we shot in 2015 and then we went into an editing phase and then worked on our pickups. Maybe a year later, we shot the dream sequences, what I call the dream sequences shorthand, I should say, that's like our production. Uh, lingo for it and um, then we went into a long period of post-production because we wanted the story to be really tight um, we also you know sourced music and, and 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 labor from people for very very little and so when you when you're on a bu budget like we are you work with people's schedules and we didn't feel like a rush um, so we started the festival circuit at the end of 2019. And of course the, the film festival circuit last year was kind of weird. Everybody was going virtually and a lot of things were pushed back. So, and you know, even in like big ticket Hollywood movie making, there's a ton of movies sitting on a shelf that, you know, they were waiting for theaters to reopen and stuff. So yeah, it's, I know it's been kind of, it's been strange. Was this your first foray in the film festival circuit? This was my first foray. What about you, Gabrielle? Is this your first as well? Yeah, also my first, yep. So first feature, first film festival circuit, uh, a lot of firsts going on. Uh, I imagine it was pretty challenging, uh, especially when it's like your first year out and, oh, whoops, there's a global pandemic and everybody's got to stay indoors. And now you're doing all of your film festival screenings and stuff via Zoom or something. Like, how did, how did you find the navigation and like, how, how has it benefited the movie in, in a way? Well, I would say that it was terrible timing for us. The main goal, I think, going into festivals was actually the networking opportunities. So much is, is like put on getting a distributor and selling the film. And like, yes, that was something that we wanted to do. But knowing that we aren't a star vehicle and we are not stars, we weren't any under any illusion that it was going to be a money maker for us. It was a calling card project and a, and a way to keep expanding our network and meeting people. So when all the festivals went digital, it was, I mean, of course ha they have to, but it wasn't, um, I, I wouldn't say there was much of a silver lining for us, for our project. I feel like with last year, it's tough because, you know, you know, us too, when we go to stuff, you know, we want to meet people, we want to shake hands, we want to like see filmmakers. I mean, uh, so much of it is is that, hey, this is my film, let's talk kind of, and you know, the deals are made over lunch the next day or, you know, when you're having drinks after a screening and it, it sucks, it, you know, that you can't do that. I do think it's good, maybe, I mean, yeah, not great timing, but maybe it was good for you guys to start out. Uh, swinging a couple of bats, if I can use a baseball metaphor, so it's a little bit harder. So maybe when you guys do the next one, it's a little bit easier. Um, and at this point, um, you know, with all of that under your belt, and Gabrielle, I don't know if this is this is your first feature, but it was your first, was it your first film? Uh, no, it wasn't my first film ever. I'd done some shorts and music videos, like the the longest thing I had done. Okay. Did you? I'm assuming that everything during production stuff didn't go perfectly. I'm sure you learned a lot. Can you talk about like kind of learning experience and, and what you took away from it? This was the, definitely the, and I, I've been an artist, uh, you know, for 15 years or so, but this was the, definitely the biggest project I had ever worked on. Um, so I learned a lot about myself and trusting my instincts and kind of pushing through because like you said, there's so many bare, there's, um, Bar not barriers, there's like bumps along the way, you know, like production wise, you know, the sun's not in the right spot. Like all these things when you have this giant crew, you know, to me it was a giant crew, it wasn't actually a giant crew, but to me it was like all these people here to help 
make our project and you know there's starting and stopping and you know all the things that happen um so for me it was learning to really like push push myself when things feel impossible and trust myself and my collaborators that we can we will figure it out and it will all work out in the end somehow <laughs> so uh lara for you so you're you're acting in this and you, you've written it at some point, I know you're, you know, working closely with Gabrielle, but at some point, do you have to kind of divorce writer Lara from actor Lara? And like, how do you, like, how are you in the moment and in the scene, you know, and also I'm assuming you're doing producing duties as well, you know, so how, like, how do you kind of compartmentalize and figure out who you're going to be on a given day? That's such a good question. And I don't know that I did that well. I would say that that was very messy for me and very hard. Um, divorcing myself from the writer Lara while I was acting was not was not hard. That I, Gabrielle and I were in a really solid space before we got to set. We had rehearsed. I knew my lines because I had been living them. It was something about me and Sandy were just so intrinsic. I didn't have to think about that. It was more so like when the work, when the script needed to open up for other performances, other actors, other characters that I was like, I think Gabrielle called it on set. I didn't, I wasn't confident enough in the script that it could be bent, bent or changed or evolved. And so that was probably where I started to dig my heels in and be like, I'm not, I'm not comfortable. I'm not ready, but we got, we got through it. But yeah, I, I would say that that was really hard and we could have used a co-producer. It was really hard to do the producing stuff on set. I was in pre-production, post-production, every phase, but when we were in actual production, I, I have a very difficult time doing, doing that job as well. Being that this is a show about indie film, I've met people in this situation several times before. It's, you know, the actor, the writer, the producer, the director, like you have like 15 different hats that you need to wear on a given day. And at some point you're directing a scene or you're in a scene and you're like, wait, did the crew get lunch today? You know, like, did we, did somebody order a pizza? Do you know, Susie's vegan. Did we get a vegan lunch for like all these different things that, um, you know, it, it seems like the little things that, but those are the things that drive you crazy and take you out of it. Like to take you out of your head, you know? And if you don't have like a really great AD or a producer on set and, you know, granted a lot of these people don't come cheap and they're hard to find if they're good, but you know, it really helps to have uh, another, pr and even a sounding board too. Because, you know, just to have somebody to communicate with and say, hey, is this, is this right? We need a, a third party on this or like, you know, to collaborate. Um, and I can imagine that, you know, doing a feature, I've, done, I've only done this sort of thing on short, but doing a feature is even harder because now instead of running a, uh, a sprint, you're running a marathon. As far as like scheduling, just to give people a rough idea, how long a shoot schedule did you guys were you guys, how long were you guys shooting for? Was it all at once or did you kind of have to do it sporadically? We shot all of the principal photography in 10 days in a row, very long days. We were very lucky to have an amazing AD, Amanda. Um, and she, you know, we would work these, you know, 14 hour days or something and then go to go home to sleep for a few hours and she would be up working on the schedule for the next day. So she really, really helped us. Um, but, you know, she had all of her stuff she had to take care of, too. So, you know, it, you, you know, we're all wearing many hats. Um, but then we also shot, I think it was just two days that we did the dream sequences, which we shot in Brooklyn. Um, we created this crazy set. Um, it, it was, yeah, it was really, it was really hot. <laughs> It was the middle of summer. We couldn't have the air conditioner on, even though in hindsight we didn't use sound. So we definitely could have used the air conditioner. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I guess we shot the film in 12 days. <laughs> it was just like totally bonkers. But you know, like this is what you do when it's your first film. You just like go for it and make it happen. <laughs> and like how many how many pages a day are you cranking through to get that pace? I honestly like do not remember. Do you, Laura? <laughs> I have no idea. I, I truly have no idea, but I know that we also left space for, I think, some B-roll and some kind of magical things that happened on set that needed to get captured. Like, yeah, we, we, 
We were go, go, go. I mean, I, we, it's the kind of production you cannot recreate. I remember when we talked before, you guys said the post process was a little bit long or like you had, that was the biggest challenge for you. Why was it challenging? What was the, what was the kind of the biggest hurdle to get over? I would say that we had a gestation period. Like you just said, we were exhausted. Um, it's an emotionally draining film. It's a very intense film to watch. And I think that there's a huge payoff to watching it, but being in it was very, very hard. It's a really small set. These are really intense scenes. Everybody is dealing with an amount of suffering and, and a lot of self-sacrifice of their time and their energy. And we were just exhausted. And so I think that one of the, the factors in the, the length of the post-production was gestating, digesting what we had done and, and where we were going. Everybody gets like their, um, it's like a little collective PTSD <laughs> that everybody's got to get over, you it's know, true, it's real. <laughs> you also have that kind of quick Bonnie experience. And then I don't know if you guys find this, but I'm always like a little depressed after the production stops. Like, even if it's really tough and exhausting, but I, I always feel like I lost a friend or something afterward. I don't, do you guys experience this? I did not experience that. <laughs> I, I think, I think because I, this was my first feature and I was just like so excited to get to the editing. I was so excited to get the footage together and like really mold it. So I was excited to get to that point. And also, like you said, there's like that post shooting trauma <laughs> that like, you're like, okay, let's move to the next thing. How long was the post process on this? Like how long, how many, did, was it like weeks, months? How long did you spend? It took us a while to find our editor. Oh, I see. And when we found her, because she wasn't our first editor that we went for. And then, so when we found our editor, Faye Gartenberg, everything fell into place. I mean, like we, it, it gave our, us and our project a whole new wind of energy. And we, I, I'm, I know it took us a while, but I really feel like it paid off because we were like waiting for her. It felt like fate. I, I feel like with um, editors too, like not only do you have to have somebody who's maybe done that kind of feature before or at least worked on a big project like that so they know how to organize everything but then you need somebody who's got like the sensibility for that type of thing who who can feel when a cut is right you know um and that's not everybody like not everybody has that kind of intuition or you know to feel for the characters i like somebody who's got perspective like somebody who wasn't there on set every day did you guys have that kind of thing where she could like look at stuff not having seen actors in costume and like, like she could just look at it for what you got, not for what you wanted. I think so. I do remember the very, when we first met um, her and I, we sat down and we just talked for a long time about what this film was supposed to be, what it was supposed to say, how it was supposed to say it. Um, and I think she got it really quickly. Um, and we spent hours and hours in the, in the editing room together. Um, this, it was just such a giant, collaborative, amazing thing. And she just added so much to it. You guys chose to distribute yourselves. You didn't go through, you didn't go through a distributor. Can you like, what was the decision making behind that? Did you, was it just something like, I just, we should just get this out or was it just too slow because everybody's in COVID times? Like walk me through the process a little bit. I mean, you kind of just basically said it, we need to get this out. And I, what I was understanding of the digital festivals was that you had to generate your own audience. And it felt like we were just locking people out with a paywall. With everybody having all these subscription services, it, people were just gonna wait till it was on a different platform that they already subscribed to. And I didn't wanna hide the film anymore behind, uh, behind different levels of payment. And so it just was like, let's just get this out. And I had a feeling that we were about to be buried in content. Even though people were shelving their movies and waiting for stuff, people were diving into the subscription services, seeing what they hadn't watched yet, watching all those series that they had, uh, you know, waiting all those docs. And I was like, I think we're gonna get buried if we don't do this now. So it felt like just a, a, a point where it was like, also so many questions about where's the industry going what what's going to be of film festivals and distribution anymore uh, are people going to be returning to cinemas all of that it just felt like 
our movie is too like it's small and it's mighty but it was like I, I felt like it was gonna get lost in the sauce and I just wanted to get it out so people didn't think they missed it or something there's a lot of that going on now and now being the way things are uh everybody feels like they're trying to climb a mountain that's like covered in uh, motor oil you know it, it's just really hard to you know, get up that slope. What do you want people to walk away with after they see the film? Things aren't always as they seem. And there's incredibly complex narratives behind what what our culture sometimes puts out as one-dimensional characters. Um, yeah, and that there, there, we, there is more to talk about. Um, I also think it's a study on trauma and the way trauma unfolds and um, an unapologetic look at the rawness of it. Yeah, trauma is a popular topic now. <laughs> it's something that we can all relate to, unfortunately. But um, it's, I think those pieces are good because now you have like, there's a bit of catharsis out there, you know, for somebody maybe going through something similar. Or, you know, they're just uh, getting over the PTSD of being under lockdown for like a year. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap up. But uh, for people who want to find the film and, and find you guys, possibly stalk you online, where can they find you? You can find us uh, on Instagram. Our film is at XRoads USA. And I'm at Hemingway Lara. It's actually at XRoads USA Film. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I did that. I did that on another podcast. Yeah, at X Roads USA Film. The the film now is streaming on Amazon Prime, correct? It is. That's okay. right. You can stream Crossroads of America on Amazon Prime. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to wrap up. Thanks so much, guys. And uh, we'll definitely, uh, when you have news, send it. Send me press releases. We'll post it. And uh, also, uh, if you guys have another project anytime soon, I'd love to have you back. Thank all you. Right. That's all we got for you today. Thanks so much for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more of our content, including our movie reviews, visit our website, norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And now you can follow us on Instagram at no Rest for the Weekend. I'd like to thank my guests, Lara and Gabrielle, and also our sponsor, JMR Rentals. From Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.